So, oh wait, there are my notes. Okay, so um, so uh, I'm going to start with what I was kind of got cut off in the middle last time. Again, the basic points in the argument for um, skepticism about what I was calling remote matters of fact. That is matters of fact um, beyond our present sensation and memory. Um, right? So the first point was that um, Remote matters of fact are always um, um, back to pause. And what I was claiming is that it's always from effect to cause. It's always actually what it really is, is from effect to cause, and then back to the collateral effect. Right, so like if I say, you know, um, so like somehow sometimes it's clear that Hume is thinking this, but many times it's not clear because the way he talks about it. So he'll say, like, I've always found that fire is associated with heat, with like heating. So like you might think that the situation is like this: there's fire, and I want to infer from it heating. But when I say there's fire, what I actually mean is that there's like the appearance of fire. Right? Then there's like that thing that you see. Um, and that, of course, is an effect of fire. Now, when I say, of course, um, like, again, we're, when we say that we're only being skeptical about remote matters of fact, it means we're not being skeptical about um, non-remote matters of fact. So, like, that there is something here that causes that appearance. Um, in Here in the inquiry, Hume is not calling it the doubt. Right, and what that thing is is fire. Um, but uh, that is fire is whatever causes the appearance of fire. And I found that fire, that is whatever causes the appearance of fire, is always accompanied by heating. Oh. Um, and so, like, when we talk about um, matters of fact that are remote because they're in the future, I remember I drew this picture, like, this is what we're not skeptical about. <laughs> matters of fact that are remote because they're in the future, um, we're saying, like, um, well, at least, okay, so here's the simplest case. We've seen the appearance of fire, we have this. We know that in the past, what caused this also caused this. So we expect whatever is here now to also cause the heating in the future, meaning like in the immediate future, right? That is, I expect that if I get my hand close to it, I'll feel the heat. 
But on the other hand, we're, we're talking about like modern attacks that are remote because they're far away or perhaps and, and or distant in, in time. Um, right, because they might be like things that were before my earliest memories, like Julius Caesar crossing a Rubicon or whatever. So, you know, what we're saying in those cases is we have some effect of those things. And we expect that if we were near them, we would see the collateral effects. <laughs> right? So, I mean, like in cases of things that are very distant in, in space and time, this is not going to be simple, like the, the appearance of fire, right? So it's like um, something way back when was responsible for the fact that I open up a book and it says, such and such a year Julius either crossed the river top. Um, from our experience, we gather there's some complicated process now, right? It's not a simple thing anymore. It has a lot of steps, but it's basically the same. From, from our experience, we gather that whatever would by this long process cause that to be written in this book, it's also such that if I were there then, I would look at it and I would say, oh, Julius Caesar is crossing the river. <laughs> that, right? So that's the way the inference always works. So that's step one. And the step two is that, um, as Hume puts it, this is on page 16, here it is constantly presupposed that there is a connection between the present fact and that which it is inferred from. So, Connection, Hume spells it like this. <laughs> of course, we spell it like this. This is also this is basically the same word. This is what Kant calls a nexus. Um, right? Where is the connection? The connection is that we presuppose it's in the external object. Right, that is because the, um, the connection is never visible to us. Again, Locke mostly agrees, except for those few exceptions. Right, your question? Uh, yeah, um, is it the connection between the cause and the effect? No, it's a connection between the two powers. So it's a connection between, and so it's and therefore also a connection between the two effects. Because the cause is always great. I mean, I think Hume and Locke agree with Barclay that the ideas themselves are inert. Right? So it's not like the appearance, it's not like we suppose. At least Hume agrees that we take the ideas themselves to be inert. This is, you know, like maybe in the end he's not going to agree that we're right about this exactly. But so it's not that we suppose that the appearance of fire causes heat. We suppose that the fire causes heat. Right? So we suppose that, you know, therefore, like we suppose that even if we hadn't seen it, you would still feel the heat. So, because um, um, we think the fire exists independently of us outside our mind. And this is where the necessary connection or the nexus connection. Um, so, and the inference always presupposes that there's such a connection in the object, right? Because again, the way the inference works is like in the past, um, the thing that caused the appearance of fire also caused heat. Why did it cause both? 
We're assuming that there's something about the object that made it cause both. That they necessarily related in the object. And if we knew the secret powers of the object, we would know why it caused both. But again, Hume says, following Locke, that like we don't know. Um, but we presuppose it. We have to presuppose it for the inference to work. And like maybe I shouldn't have mentioned what we've seen in the past yet, because in a way we're not talking about that. We, like, I mean, I, maybe I brought that in too early. The point is, the inference is always from effect to cause. Why do I think there's going to be eating if I put my hand there? Because this appearance of fire, the appearance of fire means a fire, and a fire also causes heating. Fire also causes heating, that is, I'm presupposing a uh, connection in the object. But on what basis do I, do I suppose that there's a connection in the object? And the answer is that um, such a connection is always discovered by the appearance. Right, and Hume says, this is on page 17, this is a general proposition which admits of no exception. Such a connection can always only be discovered by experience. Why can it only be discovered by experience? Because we don't know the secret powers. We never know the secret powers. You know, so if we had never had an experience with something that appears this way before, that has this glowing shape and whatever, we would have no way of knowing that it would also heat. Again, here in the, and I keep saying this because in the treatise, in the reading for the treatise is going to be different. But here in the inquiry, I mean, a little different to this in the inquiry too, where we get to section seven, but not in exactly the same way. But anyway, like so here, certainly um, in section four um, of the inquiry, we're not doubting at all that if we knew the secret power, we would know why this goes with that. There is, there are necessary connections in the object, but um, but but we don't have that basis for knowing them. We can't know them by seeing the necessity. Because the necessity is in the object, it's not in our mind, and we can't um, access it. All we have are these inert effects of it. So, um, so how can we learn which connections are there are only by experience? Yeah, I want to make sure is power here being used in the same way as it has been for the whole class. Yeah, I think so. The power, you know, the fire has a power to cause these impressions in me. Of course, that right, it's a power because it's a potentiality, right? It won't cause those impressions in me until I get close to it or you know whatever, right? Um, but it has a faculty of causing those impressions. And again, like at least at this stage in the argument, Hume is um, not, again, like what it means that we're not skeptical about non remote matters of fact is that we believe that there are such powers around us and that they're affected. But um, the point is, we can only tell what powers they are or which ones go together to make up a single object by experience. And then the last step is that um, experience doesn't. Give a reason to believe in such a connection.
right? So our belief is derived from experience, but experience can't be, the way it's derived from experience can't be that experience gives us a reason to believe it so that we can conclude somehow by some arguments that this nexus must be there. And um, right, this is, Hume says this on page 21, even after we have experience of the operations of cause and effect. And so like, again, a lot of times he talks about cause and effect. What he means is um, like, he'll call this the cause and this the effect. Right, this isn't actually the cause, but this is like the sensation for which we denominate the cause, so to speak. Right, like fire is by definition whatever causes that appearance. You know, I mean, at least in the moment we're talking about this. So it's like we okay, we know we have the cause. What about the effect? Um, but really, the cause is outside our mind. It's not the appearance, and it doesn't. The cause. Uh, I mean, this thing that I keep emphasizing about this picture, it, like, it may not be that important for understanding you, because as we'll see most explicitly in the treatise, you know, when he gets to answering Barclay, right, where Barclay is, is, is gonna say, look, you know, all you actually observe is that this comes after that. There's, there's no sense in believing there's something else that caused both. Um, Hume is going to say, yeah, well, but we're forced to believe that by certain irrational principles of our nature. Right. So, um, but, uh, so, therefore, like, it may not be that important to understanding anything in Hume. You may be able to get away with thinking the relationship between cause and effect is a relationship between impressions that we have one after another. But to understand Kant's response to Hume, if you ever want to do that, I think it's very important to understand this, the, the picture that Hume is actually talking about. Especially because Kant, Kant is responding to the anchor, not necessarily to the treatise. Right? So like in the famous, in Kant's famous example of the boats going down the stream, you know, the boats first are the boat first is, is high up the stream and then it's farther down the stream. And, um, and like Kant says, um, we need the principle of cause and effect to order these somehow, right? That we can have this one and then this one and not vice versa. And, you know, like it's common for people to think that somehow this boat up here is what causes this boat down there. But, um, that's not right. According to Kant, the cause is always a substance and it's always permanent. And what's the cause? The cause is, is the earth, right? Like the what's making the boat down to go down the stream is the gravitational attraction of the earth. Okay. That cause acts continuously throughout this process. I mean, like if the water weren't there. The boat would go down much faster. <laughs> Just turn down. Right. Anyway, sorry. That was a digression on Kant. Back to you. All right. So experience doesn't give a reason to believe in a connection. And Hume says you can see that it doesn't because what kind of reason could it give? Well, um, There would have to be a general principle that the future will be like the past. I mean, but is um, again because the like the only evidence we have that there's a connection here is that we've experienced it in the past. So how are we going to conclude from that that, we'll, that it exists in the future? And of course, again, not just in the future, that's what Hume is talking about here, but it also applies to the different events in the present and the past that are outside our uh, sensation and memory. Um, like, 
um, why should we think that things out there are like the things that we've experienced? Um, and Hume says, well, we have to assume that there's a general principle that the things, you know, things that um, we haven't experienced or have yet experienced um, were or are or will be like the things that we have experienced. Um, and where can we get that principle? Right? Because if experience is going to give us a reason to believe this, then we must have a reason to believe that general principle. Right? If we just assume that general principle for no reason, then obviously um, um, applying it here isn't giving us a reason to believe it. So where do we get that principle? And Hume says, well, there's only two ways we could have gotten it. Either we could have demonstrated it, but we can't have demonstrated it because this, that principle itself is about like remote matters of fact. And we already said that, um, like this kind of connection is always discovered by experience. So that is, we never have a demonstration of anything like this. So we don't have a demonstration of that general principle. I mean, again, like I, I wouldn't have to go back to the, to the summary here. I could go back to the reasons that made us think it in the first place, right? Like knowing, that principle would mean knowing something about the secret powers of the things in the world, and we don't. So we can't have a demonstration of that principle. So, but okay, maybe we learned it from experience. But then Hume says that's obviously circular. Right, this is the principle that we need in order to learn anything. We couldn't have learned that from experience. So therefore, we don't have a reason to believe that that general principle. We don't have either a demonstration for it, like that is, we don't um, know it in lock sense, nor do we have a probable argument for it from experience. That is, we don't have a, like a justified judgment of it in lock sense. So we don't have any kind of reason to believe it. Therefore, we don't have any reason to believe the things that, ex that we gather from experience about connections. Therefore, we don't have a reason to believe in many connections. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to interrupt you. Well, let me just hit right. So I mean, it's pretty clear how this is going to go. Therefore, um, you know, we don't have a reason to believe any of these connections. Therefore, we don't have a reason to believe any remote matters of that. And saying we don't have a reason to believe something is basically skepticism, right? Yeah. Um, so, Hume says that like in terms of like where he is as an empiricist relative to like Locke and to like Berkeley, to Berkeley, sorry. Um, it it sounds like this is kind of challenging like some of the like very like core ideas of what empiricism is. But I'm not sure that's true. Well, I mean, um, it is. Um, so, um, you know, what you said at this point, after we've reached this conclusion, is that. Um, this is like the first part of section five. You know, he says, but don't be alarmed by this skepticism. It's harmless. Right? Why is it harmless? Because, yeah, we don't believe this for a reason. That is, I mean, we don't believe it because we see a reason why it must be true. But nevertheless, something makes us believe it. 
something really strong. <laughs> so no matter what argument I make, you're still going to believe it. You do believe it, right? And Hume says, like, so do I. <laughs> you know, so like, um, we all believe that the future will be like the past. And no amount of argument can ever make that stop. Right, so, so he says, so like, why am I raising this at all? Because he says, like, I want to explain what it is that makes us believe if it's not reason, right? But so like, so in other words, the conclusion, at least from Hume's point of view, isn't gonna be, and therefore you shouldn't draw conclusions from empirical data or something like that, um, because, on the contrary, he's going to explain why you why you you can't help but do that. You're always going to do that. Um, so in that sense, you could say it's no kind of attack on empiricism. However, on a, in another sense, you could say that like showing that empiricism is some is an irrational thing that we must believe in spite of ourselves. Uh, is is a kind of and showing that that follows from empiricist principles, right? Like these are empiricist principles. You know, like rationalists wouldn't agree with that. Um, they would say that we we do see necessary connections. Um, I think I actually wrote this down here, the axiom from Spinoza's Ethics. In other place in my notes, but it's in here somewhere. Anyway, the axiom. I'm looking for it because I always forget exactly how it goes, but I think the axiom is the knowledge of the effect involves and presupposes the knowledge of the cause or something like that, right? So like a rationalist view of causation is that you know, uh, when you really understand that something is an effect, that means you find it's inconceivable without the cause. <laughs> Oh, right. So, like, these are empiricist premises, and they, but they lead to the conclusion that empiricism is irrational. And um, um, so, you can see that as a kind of reductio of empiricism. And, like, I think, you know, that is how it looks from Kant's point of view. Right? This is like why, I mean, and he sees something similar on the rational side. Obviously, if you want to know about that, you can take 100B. Which now it turns out I'm going to teach next year. That wasn't originally planned, but anyway. Um, so uh, you know, airport he, like Kant basically feels that empiricism and rationalism have to be saved from themselves. <laughs> like, you know, so again, yeah. So it depends how you look at it. I guess to, to sum up that very long answer. In some sense, yes, it's an attack on the, the core of empiricism. And in some sense, it isn't. <laughs> All right. Um, right, so and so so what is the answer? Why do we believe these things if we don't believe them thanks to reason? That is, you know, that is thanks to our faculty of understanding the reasons why things are true. Um, but, um, if you like, those are two different meanings of the word reason, but like they go all the way, there are two different meanings of the word logos in Greek. Um, depending on who you ask, they're not really two different ones, but in any case, right. So like reason is the faculty of seeing the reason things must be true, but it's not reason that makes us believe in remote matters of fact, but what is it? And Hume's answer, this is on page 30, All belief of matter of fact or real existence 
is derived merely from some object present to the memory or senses and a customary conjunction between that and some other object. Now, when we say some other object, I think, again, like, means like the object of some other sense, uh, some other impression. So it's okay, like, it's, you know, like the, the, the reasoning from wounds to pain or from the appearance of fire to the heat of fire or whatever, it's not a, re not a conclusion from one object out in the world, one object of my sensations to some other object. It's the same thing. <laughs> I guess I should say it's not a it's not a conclusion from one thing to another thing. It's it's a conclusion from one object that is the object of one impression to the object of another impression. Um, so, but okay, so and it's based on the customary conjunction of those. That is that we're used to after we see the appearance of fire under the right conditions feeling heat. Yeah, again, it has to be the right condition, right? Because if you see a fire far away, um, you're not going to feel the heat. Um, but if the right things happen, you know, you you conclude that you will feel the heat, and that if you were there close to the fire, you would feel the heat, right? Um, so, uh, um, And that, why does that happen? It's because we become used to having these two ideas together. Or, I mean, again, it's really, this is the same thing I kept pointing out in Barclay. It's not really exactly together, right? But it's like after each other or with each other in a certain sequence, according to certain rules. You know, right, because look, like, here's an example, here's the fire. First, I look at it, then I look away and put my hand in it. <laughs> so I never have the heat and the appearance of fire together, literally, like at the same time. But that's an instance of the kind of going together of the impressions that will build up this custom. Um. So that's the skeptical solution, right? Hume, section four is called skeptical doubts about something, something. Uh, skeptical doubts concerning the operations of the understanding. Why concerning the operations of the understanding? Because remember, like this whole part, the, the entire first inquiry or the first part of the treatise is about the understanding. The understanding is how we make distinctions between truth and falsehood. And we're at, right as opposed to between beauty and ugliness or virtue and vice um, or blame and praise, whatever. So um, um, so skeptical doubts about the operation of the understanding are skeptical doubts about um, how we just how we make a distinction between true and false that is how we come to believe some things and not others basically, right so um and the skeptical doubts actually Beatty, what's his name something like william or thomas or one of those names anyway um uh, who uh, to call i mean he's a younger contemporary of hume's basically one of those Scottish people, the most violent one, but not by any means the best one, who like attacks him. <laughs> um, among other things, he makes fun of the title of this chapter because he says skeptical doubts means doubtful doubts. <laughs> right. So I mean, presumably that's you know, you saying something about what type of doubt this is. That like say it's a doubt that you you entertain for um, 
for philosophical reasons, um, not like an ordinary doubt that you're you're worried whether this is true or not. You, you want to take precautions, <laughs> right? Is it? So anyway, so section four is called skeptical doubts about operations of understanding, and section five is called skeptical solution to these doubts, right? Which BB says it means doubtful solution to doubtful doubts. <laughs> But anyway, so in this, and again, the skeptical solution is it's a solution because it says, um, because it answers the question how do we distinguish between truth and falsehood? Reason isn't going to work. How do we do it? And Hume says, custom, habit, right? He treats these as synonyms. Custom and habit. Um, the, uh, the fact that we've seen these things go together many times before, just once wouldn't do it, but enough times happens, we get used to them, it, it becomes a customary conjunction. And now when we get some present matter of fact, right? So like, again, going back to this picture, like, I see the appearance of fire. I don't feel the heat yet. If I am going to, it's going to be in the future. Right? Um, but I have this present matter of fact. And thanks to the custom, I come to believe that this other matter of fact will happen in the future. So that's why there's the two parts to that explanation. Um, all belief of matter of fact or real existence. I think he should have said all belief of, like, again, this isn't his terminology, so I don't know how he would say it, but all belief of remote matter of fact or real existence is derived merely from some object present to the memory or senses, right? That's the thing, like I see the fire. So the object of that impression, namely the fire is present to my senses. So I guess I should, in a way, I should draw it inside this bubble, right? Even though I don't sense the fire directly, the fire is what's present in my senses. Right? The thing that causes the impression is what's present to my senses. This is what Locke calls sensible knowledge. The, so to speak, inference from the presence of the sensation to the presence of the object that causes the sensation. What's present to my senses is the fire, but the, the heating thing is not yet present to my senses. Um, but because of this customary conjunction, I go from the present impression of the thing that is present to my senses to believing in the future impression. So that, I mean, I guess maybe it's hard to know where to draw the fire. This has to do with what I was worrying about before. Like, if one, there's two objects, but they're both the same thing. <laughs> right? Like, the fire, quay looking like fire, is what's present to my senses. But the fire, quay heating, is not yet present to my senses. But I believe it will. Because, I mean, let's say I'm in the process of getting closer and closer to it, right? Like, I believe it will be soon. And the reason I believe it will be soon, though, is just this customary conjunction once a while. So, by the way, another like interjection about Kant here <laughs> that um, I think Kant is going to ask, what is believing that it will be? I don't think Hume answers that exactly. I'm about to talk about what Hume thinks believing in it means. And he explains how that's derived from the present impression. But what's the difference between believing that it will be versus believing that it was? Right? Like what establishes the order in the imagination of these two things? All right. 
anyway, so that, as I said, that's something that Hume doesn't have. So I'm, I'm going to go back to what Hume does talk about. So Hume, like the second part of section five, which Hume says that, like, if you don't have a taste for abstract philosophy, you can skip this section and it'll be fine. The rest of the book will be fine. So, I mean, um, like, unfortunately for you, I have a taste for abstract philosophy. So I'm not skipping it, whether you want to or not. All right. Um, but also, like, just generally speaking, when a philosopher says something like that, you have to be like really worried about why they might want certain readers to skip this section. Okay, but in any case, so uh, this what Hume does in that section is explain what belief is in such a way that um, in a way that's consistent with this conclusion, I guess. In a way that makes this conclusion natural, that explains it explains it in a limited way, but like it shows that it's an example of a more general tendency in our nature or something like that. So, so I'm gonna talk about that, but are there questions about this first before I go on? So I'm about to erase this, yes. So was Hume not an idealist? <laughs> I mean, so like here he's speaking not as an idealist. Okay. For sure. Um, uh, in the treatise, we'll see that it's more complicated. But um, I mean, he's basically going to, you know, well, I don't think we'll talk about it when he gets to it. But yeah, here he's not speaking as an idealist. Yeah. Can you briefly just go over the demonstration part of why experience doesn't give a reason to believe? Oh, the demonstration part. Yeah, like why you can't learn through demonstration, how the, um, the principle is not true. You can't learn, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's basically, it's, it's basically because this principle itself is an example of the type of principle we're talking about. Like, like it's a principle about um, necessary connection between matters of fact. Um, it's just much more general, right? But it says that, like, so basically it says like whatever powers are here, um, you know, um, similar powers will be elsewhere. But since, um, you know, that is to demonstrate that we'd have to know what these powers are, right? Like you can't demonstrate something about something that you don't know what it is. So, um, so yeah, I think that's basically the argument. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay, so, so now we get to the question of, so what is belief? That's the question that Hume is asking in part two of section five. And he said, um, right, so like he, he, he phrases the question this way, this is really, why is this so fuzzy? <laughs> so he phrases the question this way, like what's the difference between believing something and merely imagining it? I mean, What am I worried about? Like whether what you believe in is a thing like this chalk or whether it's a, what law called a proposition. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you could say, so what's the difference between believing that something exists and imagining that it exists? I actually think it doesn't make that much difference for his purposes and he, he doesn't exactly make it clear, but I mean, he thinks of it basically as,
Believing that something exists is imagining it plus something. <laughs> I guess is the way to put it. Right? So like believing that this chalk exists, at least when you're not looking at it, that because that's what we're we're talking about the difference between two different kinds of ideas, not between ideas and impressions. Right? So believing that the chalk exists when you're not looking at it is like imagining the chalk plus something else that makes that imagination into a belief. And the question is, what is that something else? And you might think, right? So like, here's the idea of the chalk. So if you just entertain the idea of the chalk, so to speak, then you're imagining the chalk. Again, remembering the distinction that Hume makes between ideas and impressions. Right, because like if you're um, Locke would say you have the idea of the chalk when you're actually looking at it, then you're not imagining it; you're seeing it, right? But Hume wouldn't use the term idea there. He would say you have the impression of the chalk, right? So if you merely have the idea of the chalk, that means you're imagining. It. Um, so you might think, what does it take to make this into the belief that the chalk exists? And you might think, well, what do you have to do? And as I argued, Locke does seem to think something like this, um, is add this other idea to it. Call this the idea of existence. Right? And now these two put together are the belief that the shock exists. That's what you might think, but Hume says it can't work that way. This is on page 31. The difference between fiction and belief. Oh, no. Uh, wherein, therefore, consists the difference between such a, such a fiction and belief? It lies not merely in any peculiar idea which is annexed to such a conception as commands our assent, and which is wanting to every known fiction. Right? It's not that, I'm sorry, wanting to every known fiction, right? So a known fiction is something that you're imagining, but you don't believe in it. As opposed to an unknown fiction, right? Where you believe the chalk exists, but it really doesn't. <laughs> so, right, he's talking about the difference between belief and known fiction, or as I said, merely imagining, right? And he's saying that. The difference between a known fiction and a belief doesn't consist in any peculiar idea which is always found in the beliefs and is absent in the known fiction. Let me read that again. It lies not merely in any peculiar idea which is annexed to such a conception as commands our assent and which is wanting to every known fiction. That's not the difference. Right? So, a conception that demands our assent. It commands our ascent is like an idea of chalk such that with something such that it consists of belief and ascent to the existence of the chalk, an affirmation of the chalk. And he's saying, no, you can't get this by adding another idea to it. Why? Well, um, The argument continues, for as the mind has authority over all its ideas, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the, the basic argument is this. If belief consisted in adding another idea to the idea of the chalk, then adding ideas to, to each other is something we can do. That's how we form compound ideas, right? Like, so if I have the idea of gold, I can add the idea of mountain to it. Now I have the idea of a golden mountain. So similarly, if I had the idea of chalk, if I wanted to, I can add the idea of existence to it. And now I believe in the chalk. Right? Because we're saying that's the diff that, that's the difference in belief and mere imagining. So as soon as I put those two ideas together, I would no longer be imagining the shock. Now I would believe it. Yeah. 
Are you saying that we can, of our own volition, have that idea of existence for anything? He's saying if there were such an idea, we could. Yeah, right? Because he's saying that we, the mind has authority over its all its ideas. So if there really were an idea of existence, such that that, that idea was what made the difference in belief and fantasy, right? Then yes, we could add it to any idea we wanted to. And therefore, we could believe whoever we want. But of course, we can't. Well, of course, we can't believe whatever we want to. I mean, the nature of this argument is it's a little bit. So, like, I just I just said it the way Hume says it, but the way Hume says it is a little bit weird because so how do we know that the mind has authority over all its ideas? Maybe this is a special idea that the mind doesn't have authority. And moreover, the truth is, Hume doesn't think the mind has quote unquote authority over all its ideas completely. This is coming up in section, section seven. Um, our authority over our sentiments, and this is page 45, our authority over our sentiments and passions is much weaker than that over our ideas. And even the latter authority is circumscribed within very narrow bounds. <laughs> right? It's not true that we can necessarily imagine whatever we want to, whenever we want. To. Um, we can try, but sometimes we can't. <laughs> and it, I mean, and actually, this is that fact is central to Hume's argument in section seven. That you know, how do we find out what we can imagine and what we can't imagine? Experience, right? Which in section seven, Hume argues that means that we don't know. Um, we don't know the power by which we cause ideas to exist by our volition. Because if we knew it, we wouldn't have to find out by experience what it could do. We would already know, right? So, but anyway, bringing that same thing back here, you could say, well, look, who says maybe that's just really hard to do? Um, maybe it's impossible, or maybe it's just really hard. We usually can't do it. So, I mean, I think, although this is definitely risky because I'm like attributing something to, to Hume that he really doesn't say, but um, I think the point is that. Like, if belief were, um, something that the mind could, in principle, have authority over, quote unquote, um, um, then it wouldn't really be belief. Um, that is, it wouldn't do the thing that belief is supposed to do, right? I mean, the the whole point of belief is that it's supposed to um, be what you have to take into account when you decide what you want. I mean, that's how Hume describes it when he tries to explain um, uh, later on, like what what the idea that is a belief is like. Now, I guess that's even what he says at the very beginning of, of part two of section five. Like, what is it about this? What is it about belief that we need to account for? It's that the belief um, has a much stronger influence on our actions than the mere imagination, right? Like, if I imagine. Um, you know, that the building is burning down, I'm not going to do anything. But if I believe that the burning is, that building is burning down, then I'm going to run outside and call the fire department and whatever, right? So, um, so like the whole point of belief is that um, it, it's supposed to be the thing that determines what you do or do not want to do. So, like in principle, it can't be something that the mind, quote unquote, would have authority over. And moreover, I think just more generally speaking, and this is important because in the end, 
it's not clear in what sense Hume really thinks that a mind has authority over anything. Um, that you know, it can't be the kind of thing that follows by association from our previous train of ideas. Um, because the whole point of it is that it's what breaks in on that train and makes us change it. Um, so, um, so therefore, if an idea is the kind of thing that we can by volition or even like by association or whatever, bring into combination with another idea, then belief is not an idea. Or belief doesn't differ from imagination by the inclusion of an idea, right? So, like, I didn't call this the idea of belief. It's not the idea of belief, it's the idea of existence. Who doesn't say what the idea is called, but that's what it would be called. <laughs> the idea of existence, the thing that you would connect in order to make it a belief. So, he says, this can't be right. It can't be an idea. So, what is it if it's not an idea? Well, um, what he says is, this is farther down on page 31, it follows therefore that the difference between fiction and belief lies in some sentiment or feeling, which is annexed to the latter, not to the former, right? But it's annexed to belief and not to fiction, and which depends not on the will, nor can be commanded at pleasure. Right, so it's not an idea, but it's a sentiment or feeling. The sentiment or feeling, I think, is a kind of impression. I mean, certainly, at least on page 41, Hume seems to equate sentiment and inward impression. Um, right there, he contrasts that which appears to the outward senses with sentiment or inward impression. So I think a sentiment or a feeling is a kind of impression, and in particular, it's a kind of inward impression. Yeah. Are we, in a sense, sort of subject? To maybe you wouldn't call it the will of belief, but we are sort of like we fall in line with our beliefs. We do not control our beliefs. Our beliefs control us. Well, that I mean, yeah, but control us. I mean, that makes yeah. it sound like I mean, the whole point of having a will is to like bring your actions in line with your beliefs, right? Like if there weren't something to, if, if there weren't that kind of quote unquote control, then there'd be no point to having a will. Um, that's that's why I'm saying that, that like if, if the supposed idea of existence were like that, then it would have no purpose. Um, so, but a sentiment or feeling or impression is something that depends not on it. Well, actually, in that other place, he said the mind sometimes has a certain authority over its sentiments and passions, but it's much weaker. <laughs> um, so. And the truth is, like, maybe trying to get yourself to believe something or not to believe something is kind of like trying to get yourself not to be angry or, you know, does a similar type of difficulty. <laughs> um, again, like, Hume doesn't say that. I'm just trying to put what he says in different places together. The point is that it's like, uh, um, it, the nature of sentiments or feelings or impressions to at least like be resistant to our will. Um, remember that for Barclay, that was part of the like definition, perhaps the definition of what Hume calls impressions, but they're not subject to our will. And Barclay says, because they're subject to the divine will. So, I mean, Hume is, is agreeing with Barclay about that, again, at least up to a point. Here, he's, like, from what he says here, anyway, it seems like he's agreeing with him absolutely. It's not subject to the will. 
And so it is fit to serve that function. Right, and so like at least the, the first way to think about this is that, you know, the idea of the chalk, when I believe in it, is accompanied not by the idea of existence, but the impression of existence. Right, and that explains why I can't believe it at my will, just like I can't see the chalk by my will. I have to wait for it to make an impression on me or to cause an impression in me. Um, similarly, I can't just believe what's shocked by my will because I have to wait for this impression. Now, like, So this also, you know, would explain why reason can't um, bring about beliefs in remote matters of fact. Um, because the conclusion of a demonstration is always going to be an idea, not an impression. Um, and Hume says that as part of an argument against Locke on page 42. Um, this is footnote 26 on page 42. Hume is one of the earliest authors to have footnotes. I'm not sure exactly when it starts. But anyway, so, so, so this is Hume's footnote. I guess Locke also has footnotes. Yeah, Hume maybe. All right, anyway. Mr. Locke in his chapter of power says that finding from experience that there are several new productions in matter and concluding that there must be somewhere a power capable of producing them, we arrive at last by this reasoning at the idea of power. But no reasoning can ever give us a new original simple idea as the philosopher himself confesses. This therefore can never be the origin of that idea. Right, so in context, he's like he's arguing that we can't reason to an idea that we've never had an impression. Um, so that if Locke says we reason to the idea of power, Hume says, Locke, you yourself says we can't say we can't get simple ideas that way. We can only get them from impression. But the reason I'm saying that it's basically the same argument, or it's two aspects of the same argument. Obviously, like the reason reason can't produce. Uh, a new simple idea is because new simple ideas have to come from impressions and reason can't produce an impression. Okay, so, so belief is, is or is the result of, so like now it's a little hard to, to know how to say this, but it's, um, because at first, you know, what I first said is belief in the chalk is the idea of the chalk plus the impression. But I guess um, the way Hume thinks about it, starting at this point, is more like belief in the chalk is the impression. Um, that's the belief part, so to speak. Right? So, so, the, so the belief is the belief in an idea is like an impression of that idea, about that idea. So I think Hume does think, and if we read the second part of the treatise or the dissertation on the passions, you'd be able to see this in general. Hume does think that sentiments or feelings or passions unlike outward impressions, do have a kind of like about the student. Right? Like anger is anger at someone or something. So like when you have the anger, and the anger 
when you're really being when you're really angry as opposed to imagining anger the anger is a sentiment or feeling that it's an inward impression if you're just imagining being angry then it's an idea right but if you're actually angry angry then the anger is an impression like this but it's it's not just an you know so suppose you're you're angry at this guy peter john peter suppose you're angry at peter Maybe I should call Socrates. Well, <laughs> one of the one of the above. So, uh, um, it doesn't just mean you imagine Peter, and at the same time you feel this impression, right? That would be just like being angry and imagining Peter. Being angry at Peter means that the anger somehow is about it. So, like, I mean, why Hume thinks that sentiments and passions have the ability to do this, whereas outward impressions don't? At least I think he thinks outward impressions don't, right? They're not about anything. Is I don't know. I guess maybe he just thinks, well, obviously. <laughs> I'm not sure. But in any case, so this is so so that like this is no exception. We get this impression that now he's gonna call belief. He said the impression, it's not just that we have this impression that at the same time we have the idea of the child. This impression is is about this idea of the child. So instead of being angry at the shock, we're like believing in the shock. That's the passion. So what kind of passion is it? Well, So first of all, Hume says, well, a passion or sentiment or feeling can't really be defined, right? Like if you've never felt anger, I can't tell you what it is. Yeah, I mean, that's funny because most of the other early modern philosophers have a, like a whole chapter, some, including Locke, have a whole chapter somewhere with the definition of the passion. Right, like anger is pain associated with blah blah blah, plus the desire to revenge, or you know, yeah. What is the third, um, like node in the uh, like model there? The the one above Peter. Uh, oh, this is the idea of Peter. Oh, yeah, it's not. really, I mean. So whatever. Anyway, that's the idea of Peter, and the anger is about the idea of Peter, right? It's like, I mean, that it's. I guess when Peter is here and you're angry, then the anger is about the impression, but you just think about uh, and about the idea. Anyway, um, right. So Jim says, right. So I mean, I guess like what he means is. He's thinking of anger, and I think Locke also agrees with this. It's just the question is how to put that together with those definitions. Um, I mean, it's the, like the fundamental issue is about pain and pleasure. But in some sense, you can say what they are, but in another sense, you can't. I mean, actually, to tell you the truth, it's, it's exactly like the issue about solidity. You can't define solidity, but you can say what solidity is. Solidity is the is the idea you get when such that you know that your hands can never fit closer together. <laughs> right. Oh, so uh, so anyway, like so he's thinking of anger as a kind like a color, basically, right? As a kind of its own sensation. That happens to be the sensation that's caused in us when, and then you can fill in that whole definition, 
right? When someone has wronged us, we want to avenge ourselves, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, but what the citation actually is, you can't tell anyone any more than you can tell them what white is. So I think that's what Hume actually is trying to get at when he says what we can do, right? So he says, so he says, like, similarly, I can't, like, if you want to know what impression is this, he says, well, the name of this impression is belief. <laughs> you know what belief is, right? That's what it is, <laughs> right? It's just like if someone were to ask you, you know, what is the meaning of white? You would say, well, this is white. <laughs> and you have to look at it, you know. And then, uh, you know, but if you're like, if you're blind, then that, there's no way to tell you. So similarly, like, if you never had had belief, um, uh, the word would be meaningless to you, but of course, everyone has always had beliefs, right? So Hume says, everyone has had this impression, and we have a word for it, and the word is belief, right? So if you want to know more about it than that, like if you want me to define that word, it's not possible because it's the word for a simple impression. But he says, um, so let's continue on page 32. Um, It may not, however, be improper to, oh, let me see. Oh, yeah, okay, it will work. It may not, however, be improper to attempt a description of this sentiment in hopes we may, by that means, arrive at some analogies, which may afford a more perfect explication of it. Right, so a description of something is um, something you say about it that singles it out, but doesn't tell you what it is. So like traditional examples of this, this, this is uh, ancient, Terminology, I guess in Greek it's typographe, uh, something like that. Since it's being translated as as descriptio or description in English, so uh, like you know, like if you say um, a human being is an animal that cooks its food and laughs, something like that, right? So. Like that may be enough information to tell exactly which animals are human beings and which are not. But uh, it's not it's not a definition because it doesn't tell you what the essence of human being is. This is like the old you know the thing that Locke makes fun of in Aristotelian philosophy: the idea that every type of things has it has an essence that makes it what it is. Um, but just generally speaking, like if you can't define something, um, you can't give some words that mean the same thing as the word you're trying to define. But you can give some words that are a good guide to when to use the word and when not. That's a description. Right, and this actually is the ancestor, like if you, you know, if if you study 20th century philosophy and people starting with Russell talking about definite description, um, that's that, that's the same use of the word description, right? Like the present king of France would be a description of someone if there were a present king of France. It's called a definite description. Anyway, getting so getting back to Hume, so he's saying we can't define belief, but we can give a description of it. But it's just like we can't define solidity, but we can say solidity is the impression you get when blah blah blah, right? So, but that's not exactly the, the approach she was going to take because, like, it says what he's going to do is try to find some analogies. That is, in, so instead of saying what belief is, he's going to say like belief is to something as something else is to something else. 
that's when it announced this. And sure enough, then he gives an, some analogies and like, I think, um, um, maybe, I don't know if it's the most important one, but any one of them is the analogy to a certain aspect of color perception. Right, it's the aspect of what's now called saturation or chroma. Right, like I guess you could call it brightness, but brightness is kind of ambiguous. So, you know, it's the difference between um, so you can have you ever seen like a color solid or or ever used like hue saturation and what they call it? Oh, yeah. What? The saturation value, I think. Hue saturation and um, lightness. So I forget what they call the third one, but you know, when you like switch to that in Photoshop instead of RGB, <laughs> right? There's like there's like three dimensions in which colors vary from each other. And the color solid usually you take the hue one is is put in a circle, right? Because even though the electromagnetic spectrum is not like this, our our color vision like red shades back into blue by way of purple, right? So it's like a circle. It goes from, from red towards blue and back to red. And then like um, in this direction, you have lighter and darker, right? So you can take exactly the same shade of red and so to speak, mix it with more no, no, I guess not mix it with more black is not the way to look at it. But yeah, you can make it darker and darker version of the same shade of red or lighter and lighter. And then in this direction, and this is, you know, so this is saturation or chroma. And I think that's the aspect of color perception that Hume is making analogy to here. Like on this axis, you have like on the dark end, you have black, and on the top you have white, and, and in between you have shades of gray, right? So the axis is gray. And then as you go out from the axis, the gray changes into brighter and brighter colors. Um, I guess it would help if I actually could show you a color <laughs> what I'm talking about. But you know, I mean, think of it this way. So like you know, you can have a very light blue that is incredibly bright, or you can have a very light blue that is barely blue at all, it's basically light gray. You don't see a little bit of blue, right? That's that's like you're moving along this direction, not changing the hue or the um, lightness, but just changing that saturation. So I spent too much time on that. I definitely spent too much time on that. I'm probably interested in this for other reasons. But um, but the reason I think that it's that it's this that he's making the analogy to is so this is actually a quote from the treatise where he makes more explicit about this. When you would anyway vary the idea of a particular object, you can only increase or diminish its force and vivacity. If you make any other change on it, it represents a different object or impression. The case is the same as in colors. A particular shade of any color may acquire a new degree of liveliness or brightness without any other variation. But when you produce any other variation, it is no longer the same shade or color, right? So the point is that like, um, if you change, if you go in this direction, and I guess also if you go in this direction, but anyway, definitely if you go in this direction, I think this is what he's calling shade, right? That um, every step you make is going to be a new idea, a completely different idea than the one you had before. 
right? So like red is just a different kind of idea than slightly orange or red. Um, but if you go in this direction, he's saying, you're not really having a new idea. You're just in some way changing the intensity of the same idea. You're like dialing it up and down. Right, so that's why, like, in that missing shade of blue argument, I take it he's talking about this direction. Right, like the missing shade of blue is a missing hue. And if I can fill that in with that experience, that's a counterexample to the rule that I can't have an idea that isn't a copy of a previous impression. But, um, but it wouldn't be a counterexample if I've seen every degree of saturation of that shade except one. Because there, Hume says, yeah, of course, once you have an idea, you can also like adjust its vivacity. Now, I mean, this analogy is not precise. It better not be precise because the whole reason we ended up here is that we don't want to be able to adjust this. <laughs> Right. So like um, um, um um it's also I mean this also shows that um, what Kant called the anticipation of perception, the content of which is basically that every uh, sensation has an intensity, has an intensive magnitude to it, as, or intensive is an intensive quantum, uh, which Kant says is a synthetic a priori principle. According to Hume, we do know that, a priori, so to speak, but it's not a connection between different ideas, because it's the same idea when you vary them. Okay, if you uh, didn't understand that, never mind. But um, so, uh, um, but anyway, the, uh, the analogy isn't perfect, as I said. If it were perfect, it would screw everything up. Um, but also, okay, fine. So it's like it's just an analogy to help us understand. It's certainly not supposed to be the same thing, right? Like belief in the chalk is not belief, is not an idea of the chalk being really bright. <laughs> um, but it's like that. It's a it's like a respect in which ideas can vary in the intensity of the impression they may have, something like that. Now, um, That's actually kind of confusing. So, like, when I believe more strongly, and I mean, so, like, it's important that this has this, like, intensive quantity to it. Because like that's a characteristic that belief has, right? You can believe weakly, or you can believe more. You can believe more. You can believe more. That's he puts it for that purpose in chapter in section six when he talks about probability. Um, but like, what is changing in so to speak vividness or brightness or strength or vivacity or whatever when that happens? Is the idea changing? Is the idea becoming more vivid, or is the impression becoming more vivid? I mean, that is, is the, 
is the idea being more vivid and the impression which is always there is now is an impression that the idea is more vivid? <laughs> or is it that um, the idea remaining the same has somehow managed to cause a more vivid impression? So I used to think that it was the first one of those, that the idea, when I believe more strongly, the idea gets more vivid, and the impression that constitutes belief is the impression that the idea is more vivid. Um, but now I think neither of those are right. <laughs> um, I mean, like one way to see that neither of those are right is to take the case of an impression. So if the chalk, if I'm actually looking at the chalk, now I really believe that it exists. Right? Now I believe it exists as strongly as I ever could if I'm actually looking at it. So then I have not the idea of chalk, but the impression of the chalk. And remember, the impression is supposed to differ from the mere idea in that the impression is more vivid and et cetera, like use those same terms before. So like we want to say it's the kind of the end result of this, like as you increase the strength of the belief, when it gets as strong as possible, then the idea is no longer an idea, but it's an impression. But now, if we say that the in this case the belief and an impression consists in the impression that this is an impression, <laughs> that's like an endless regress, right? Like you can't need another impression. Um. Um. Because, like, so to speak, you know. Um, in having this impression that this is an impression, that means we believe this is an impression. We believe this is an impression, and on this view, that would mean we have an impression that this is an impression. That can't be right. Um, and like I, I think now yeah, the way to right way to think about this is that. Um, Every idea has a kind of like impressionness about it. Um, it has a kind of like impression like strength. And so there's really just one thing there it's an idea. But like in a certain sense, it's like an impression. Um, in what sense? Well, the proper name of this is belief, right? You can't, you know, but it's it's the sense in which it has more of the effect on our actions, for example, than an impression does. Right? So like believing the building on fire is more like seeing that the building is on fire. <laughs> Than, than is really imagining that's on fire. Like merely imagining it's on fire is is still something. Like it's not going to make me run out of the building and call the fire department, but it's going to like affect me something, right? But uh, um, but the more strongly I believe in it, the more it's going to approach the effects of seeing. It. Um. And I, I think like a better way to put what, what Hume is saying here is that um, like ideas are under the authority of the mind and impressions are not. And neither are ideas insofar as they're like impressions. <laughs> right, so insofar as it's merely an idea, the mind may have authority over. But it can't just adjust its impression like strength. 
That has to come from somewhere else. And where does it come from? It comes from impressions. And how does it come from impressions? Well, because like this is how it comes from impressions. And this is why part two of section five goes together with part one of section five. There's a present impression. Here's the fire. The present impression is like the appearance of fire. Now, like by association, by habit, the um, this impression like brings along with it a certain idea, the idea of heat. But this idea of heat gets a certain strength from the impression. The strength it gets from it is what we call belief. <laughs> right? So that's why, like, if I merely imagine fire, that will also lead me to, right? If I have the idea of fire, that will lead me to have the idea of heat. But because it started with an idea that didn't have any impression like strength, the associated idea that comes along also doesn't have it. Yeah. So uh, is Hume's view that there is no like answer for this of like why an impression would like um of, like why we why why we why we would believe something uh, about about an impression? Um, yeah, well, he said so. It's like <laughs> why we would believe something about it's. I mean, like what that turns out to mean is that the impression like lends some of its force to the ideas that come along with it through association. Right, and it, like a big part of part of uh, part two of section five is the claim that that's true not only in this kind of case of cause and effect, but also, for example, in the case of resemblance. Right. So if we look at a picture of our friend, that makes the idea of our friend more lively, and that's why we want to look at the picture. But he says, um, uh, if we don't have a picture, we're not going to imagine a picture of our friend. To get us to think of our friend. I mean, it still would get us to think of our friend, but it wouldn't make it any more lively. Right? So the general principle is supposed to be that an impression lends some of its liveliness to whatever ideas come along with it by association. And do we have an explanation of that general principle? Um, Hume says no. Right? That's just like one of the general principles of human nature that we've learned from experience. At this point, you may be able to see more of what I was saying last time about the worry that there may be some circularity here. Like, I was, he's just like trying to explain why um, learning things from experience is just a matter of acquiring a custom and whatever. And yet in that very like argument, he assumes that we can learn things from experience and use it to prove something. But like I said, I think on Hume's part, that's not an inconsistency. Because again, the conclusion of the argument is going to be that we do learn things through experience and we must, we can't help it. Even though the explanation for it isn't reason, the explanation is custom, right? So Hume has learned from experience this, these principles of the, this, this like association of principle of the mind. Well, actually, no, it's not just the association principle, but this other thing, right? It's, so it's, the association principle is that I give that have occurred together in the past. If you get one of them now, the other one will come along. But this is an added one that namely, if that first one was an impression, and the one that comes along will have a certain impression likeness to it. And so, so yeah, so we can't explain this because we don't know the secret powers of the mind any more than we know the secret powers of bodies. And again, at this point, Hume is not being skeptical about whether there is a mind that has secret powers. Um, so, uh, but, we, but he's saying we don't know. Them. Um, in another sense, we can explain this, right? Hume says those who delight in discovering final causes 
may you know be interested to add this one to their collection, right? Because we can explain what the purpose of this is, right? The purpose of it is suppose for a moment that nature really is regular. Right, the, like things, and and Hume says okay, you do suppose that you must. <laughs> so suppose for a moment that nature really is regular, and things that have gone together in the past are likely to go together in the future. So this principle ensures that we'll expect the right thing. Overall, right? I mean, of course, sometimes we're going to make a mistake because our experience is, has been too narrow and whatever, right? But overall, this is gonna this is gonna explain that this is gonna cause our mind to track nature in the right way. And Hume says, and it'll be better for that than reason, right? Like if you imagine that we had to do a little demonstration every time. Well, I mean, we know that infants can't do that, for example. That's another one of Hume's arguments why. The principle uh, that the future will be like the past couldn't have been learned by demonstration because he says this demonst if you come up with a demonstration that's like really complicated that's supposed to have this conclusion um, why you know uh, explain why it is that little children who can't understand this demonstration already expect the future to be like the past <laughs> right but in this context he says. So, and that's why it relies on nature to make this depend on custom or habit rather than reason. Because um, reason is too difficult and unreliable. It's hard, we, you know, not everyone can do it very well. Um, the infants can't do it, non-human animals can't do it, or at least human things they can to some extent, but um, not as well. So like, um, like tying this to reason would make it very precarious, right? Like if I put my hand in the fire and ow, then the only way I would know not to put my hand in the fire again would be to like do some complicated metaphysical reason, the transcendental deduction, right? <laughs> Hume says that not that that's going to result in a lot of people burning their hands. <laughs> so in that sense, we can explain why we have this principle. Of course, like to make that an explanation, you have to assume number one that nature really is regular, and number two that somehow we've been set up for you know for our benefit, which at least prior to Darwin is a like a difficult assumption, to, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think. All that thing was a long answer to the question. Does Hume explain why? <laughs> yes and no. Um, and now I'm out of time. So uh, I won't talk about section seven, but oh well. <laughs> I'll see you next week. Well, Professor, on the syllabus, it said that there was a note.